Welcome to today's class on water conservation essentials. My name is Todd Sutton and I work for the city of Martinez as their sustainability consultant. Today's class is called Every Drop Counts and, and that's, that's the case here today. We really are wanting to focus on your individual power as it relates to conserving water. Long ago, when the earth was young, the skies rained and there was plenty of water. And those people of that time had plenty of resources. Now fast forward a few hundred years or a few thousand years rather, and now we have millions and billions of people on the planet Earth and they're all consuming water. Every day, you and I consume hundreds of thousands and billions of gallons nationally. As you know, we're right in the middle of a severe drought that's been going on for several years. And I think it's important for us to stop for a minute to understand where our water comes from. So we're going to start with the Sierra Nevadas. We've got a snow melt up in the Great Sierras. And that water melts down and feeds the Great California Delta, which is the San Joaquin and Sacramento Rivers. Some of that water is diverted over the Contra Costa Canal. And then some of that water is diverted over to the Los Vaqueros Reservoir, where ultimately water comes out of your water tap. I'd like to stop right now and have Chris Dundon come in from the Contra Costa Water District and discuss the California regulations on water conservation. Good morning. My name is Chris Dundon. I'm the Water Conservation Supervisor at Contra Costa Water District. Back in 2014, the governor declared that we were in a severe drought. He declared the emergency and he called on all Californians to conserve water in every way possible. In April of 2014, he asked every city and community to reduce their water use by 20%, and agencies up and down the state did so. The severity got worse, and as you can see in this uh, map here, California is in a very severe drought right now. It's in what we cons uh, consider an exceptional drought. And most of it is in the Central Valley, and in the area we're in here in Martinez. Let me talk for a moment about uh, snowpack. You know your water comes from a reservoir. You can think of a reservoir as perhaps a lake where we pump water and it goes into a canal and comes to you. It could be a reservoir in the city hills in Martinez. You might see a tank. That's a reservoir. The biggest reservoir we have in California is the Sierra snowpack. Think of it as a giant tank holding water all the way through spring and then it lets it out during the spring and summer. Our reservoir is at lowest level ever. The Sierra snowpack is now at 5% of what it should be on average. That's lower than the previous lower, lowest uh, level, which was in 1977 at 25%, and again in 2014. So we're really, our snowpack is really low this year. So in 2015 now, since the snowpack has been real low and we're moving our way now into the summer, we're draining our reservoirs. So this is an example of a uh, uh, one of the major reservoirs in California. Three of the key reservoirs are Shasta, Folsom, and Orville. All of them are very much below what they should be at this time. In April of 2015, this year, the state imposed some mandatory restrictions. The governor said, I'm, exec I'm, I'm issuing an executive order mandating substantial water reductions across our state. As Californians, we must pull together and save water in every way possible. He authorized the State Water Resources Control Board to have a statewide reduction of 25%. So the mandate was to reduce 25% statewide, and he authorized the State Board to determine how they would implement that. So it didn't mean that every community had to cut 25%. They evaluated how low some communities were and how high some were, and so it ranged anywhere from 10 to 35% what each water district was asked to cut. Contra Costa Water District, which serves this area, including the city of Martinez, were asked to cut 28%. In addition to the reduction, the, the, the call for reduction in water use, uh, there's also the state board adopted a series of water waste prohibitions. Many of these are fairly basic, and a couple are a little bit more draconian. Uh, no using water to wash down sidewalks. That's a given. When you're in a drought, you just, you shouldn't ever do that. 
no runoff when irrigating. So if you've got a sprinkler system, you want to run it now and again with you standing there to see that you don't have a broken head or a turned nozzle that's spraying onto the sidewalk. No washing cars or trailers when you don't have a shutoff nozzle. No using uh, potable water in a non-recirculating fountain. Um, and here's two key ones that are very different from us. Some of these we have, have, have had adopted for years, but no watering within 48 hours after a rainfall. It's as sim simple as saying, if it rained, if in two weeks we get a, a nice big rain, turn your timer off for a couple of days. And then I think the biggest change that we're seeing is no irrigation more than two times per week. That's probably the biggest change we've seen in the regulations. And finally, no watering during the daytime. You don't want to water in the day because you get a lot of evaporation. Restaurants and uh, hotels have a couple extra uh, requirements on them. Uh, restaurants and other food service can only serve water uh, when asked. So they're not supposed to come and bring you six glasses of water you know, for your family until you ask for it. And hotels and motels need to provide their guests with options for uh, having their towels and linens not laundered every day. And most hotels, I think we find now, are doing that. And finally, uh, the state mandate on water agencies, so on City of Martinez or on Contra Costa Water, uh, impose, uh, we're supposed to impose the restrictions on outdoor irrigation, so the state had those mandates. We, in turn, adopted those and mandated for our customers. We're required to notify customers when they have leaks, which we do, and we report our water use to the state now every month. So if you want to go see how other agencies are doing, you can go to the California Department of Water Resources website and uh, you can see how each agency is doing month by month. And finally, we get water waste complaints daily and we deal with those and 99% of them we just deal with education. Customers don't know that the sprinkler's broken and we need to report on those as well to the state. And next we're going to have uh, Chris Kanyev talk about regulations within the city. Our temporary drought pricing adjustment, which was also mandated by the state of California, was to Im implement pricing incentives to uh, uh, get people to conserve water. That was the reason that we implemented a pricing adjustment, which in our uh, water district that amounts to 50 cents per unit of water used. A unit of water is 748 gallons, so when you're looking at your water bill, uh, you'll see your 2013 consumption history, which will be in gallons, and you'll see your projected reduction uh, usage for 2015. Uh, it'll be on the right-hand side of underneath your bill in a, in a nice little box, and we were able to do that for the customers, and I think it'll be a, a really good tool for people to be able to manage their uh, reduction goals. Um, <clears throat> Single-family residences using less than 200 gallons a day will receive a credit back of the 50 cents a unit. Uh, on, their, on their water bill. So if you're using um, more than 200 gallons a day, then you'll, you'll have a pricing adjustment of 50 cents a unit. If you're using less, you'll see a credit back on your bill of that same uh, adjustment. Thank you, Chris, for answering those questions. I'm gonna start with a pop quiz. How much water does the average single household family use every day? Any ideas? Any guesses? The answer is 364 gallons per day. That's the average here in Contra Costa County. And we're going to use that number moving forward as we discuss ways to conserve at home and outside. So this frame right here shows that 364 gallons per day broken down by outdoor use and indoor use. It's 58% outdoor use or 211 gallons per day and 42 gallons, or 42% or 153 gallons per day. Those are your basic numbers. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that indoor number, that 153 gallons, and we're gonna focus in on ways to reduce that number. But before that, I wanna really focus in on, on that 364 gallons per day. It multiplies out to be a hun over 132,000 gallons per day. That's a lot of water, and if you start looking at it as an individual unit, imagine having all those gallon jugs around. We've got a lot of water that we consume. And another way of looking at it is in 55 gallon drums. If you take your daily allotment, you every day use 6.65 55 gallon drums. So imagine every day somebody, a truck, delivering 6.6 
55 gallon drums to your household. That's really what's happening when you take that 364 gallons and multiply it out. So every day we're using this amount of water and so we need to reduce our 6.6 .6 down significantly. So our target here in Martinez is 25 percent. That's 91 gallons per day total and it's broken down to 38 gallons indoor and 53 gallons outside. So we're going to go indoors here and talk about that but let's let's do another quiz here and then we'll move on. Which of the following uses the most water per day? Toilets, dishwashers, faucets, or showers? Showers, someone says. Faucets, dishwashers. All right, well, you've got all the answers there, but let's find out. The answer is toilets. 38 gallons per day, followed a close second by showers, and then faucets, and then lastly, dishwashers. And we're going to talk about all four of those shortly here. So water use indoors. I think part of conservation starts with the desire. First, it starts by the desire to save water. And then once you have that desire, you focus in on that. And wasting water costs us a lot. Not just money, but it costs us a lot of wasted energy as well. And, it, and, and the delivery of water takes a lot of energy, which correlates into greenhouse gas emissions. So by simply conserving water, you're saving in a lot of different ways. So the idea is just to get focused on that desire to save and then pay attention and do that every day moving forward. And that goes along with other practices in our daily life. How many minutes per day does the average household run their faucets? Nine minutes, 35 minutes, 15 minutes, 27 minutes, or 19 minutes? What's your guess? 27, 35. 19. Well, here's the number. It's 35 minutes a day. It's a long time. Imagine, imagine doing that in one, in one, one uh, shot there. Just turning on your faucet for 35 minutes. You, after about five minutes, you think, man, that water's been on a long time. But in actuality, every household in the state of California is running their faucet 35 minutes per day. So I look at that as a great opportunity for water reduction. We're going to talk about faucets and water reduction shortly, but here is a graph showing basically the breakdown of water use indoors. Now, due to rounding, the, 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 the numbers on the bottom show 20% and 20% and 19, and the bars are a little offset, but again, this, this shows that the number one source of water use is toilets, followed by showers, faucets, leaks, and clothes washers. And we're going to go through all of those starting right now. An organization called Aquacraft did a study statewide focusing in on water consumption in California. And one of the finding is, findings is very interesting. It shows right here that 55 gallons per household per day can be saved by just some basic changes in your household. First off, using a conservative clothes washer that has a maximum of 20 gallons per load. The next is to reduce miscellaneous faucet use by 10%. Reducing and or eliminating leakage can, re can save 25 gallons per day. And using a low flow toilet that has a, a setting or, or a, f a use maximum of 1.25 gallons per flush. If a household had those four practices in motion or set, you would say 55 gallons per day, which by the way is two gallons over your outdoor goal. So there, there's some good numbers right now. So let's jump in and talk about toilets here. Here are your basic numbers. Again, we mentioned already 36 gallons per household per day. The average flush is 2.76 gallons per flush, 13 flushes per household, and five flushes per individual. Okay, so these are the basic numbers. Now that would be different for you, but these are the state averages and we're going to use those moving forward. So 
when we talk about different types of toilets, there are high flow and low flow and ultra low flow, high efficiency toilets. So the, the high flow, the kind of the old fashioned toilets, use anywhere from three and a half to five gallons per flush. The ultra low flow use 1.6 gallons per flush and the high efficiency toilets use 1.8 gallons, 1.28 gallons per flush. So 20% of your daily use is coming from a toilet. Now, I, I'm gonna break this down to an individual and what, what you can do individually to save water as it relates to using the toilet. So, if one person you, uses the toilet, you can see, uh, depending on the type of toilet you have, will determine how much water you can use or save. Uh, with a high flow over 6,000 gallons, with an ultra low flow just under 3,000 gallons, and with a high, effic high, effic high efficiency toilet, just over 2,300 gallons per flush annually. So if an individual can move away from five gallons per flush and reduce that by two flushes, you will save over 14.5% of your daily reduction target, okay? So reducing of the five by two, you're gaining 14% on your target. And we're gonna tally all that up at the end here. So here's the action that we want you to take as it relates to toilets. Eliminate all the leaks. Check to see if the flapper is leaking. Check the tank level. If it's too high, it's gonna overflow that little overflow spout and you're gonna, you're gonna every once in a while hear it auto-filling. Don't use the toilet as a waste basket. Don't just throw things in there and then flush it away. Test for leaks. The county, the, the Contra Costa Water District is offering these uh, dye tablets. If you don't have these dye tablets, you can just use food coloring, like you'd use to make uh, color your frosting on a cake. And you put, that, you put the tabs in the tank, or you put some dye in the tank, and wait a few minutes and flush, and if, if the, the bowl has a color in there, then you've got a link, so fix that. There are many water saving options or devices that you can use. One that is possible is using this, this bladder. Now this bladder, I want you to understand, is just for a, a very high flow toilet. Nothing low flow or ultra low flow would be used for this because what happens is, is that, that bag goes in there and it displaces the amount of water in the tank. And if you put this in a low flow toilet, when you flush, you're not gonna get enough volume of water and you're gonna have to flush a second time. So this bladder is very good if you've got multiple toilets in the house and you're not gonna replace all of them, you can put one of these bladders in a high flow toilet. Another option is an aftermarket kit that you can buy that will allow you to have kind of a dual flush on your toilet. The old saying and the new saying now is when it's yellow, let it mellow. When it's brown, flush it down. So there you go, you can use that dual flush system and they're sold in kits and you go in there and, and uh, install that yourself or, or hire a plumber to do that for you. And there's your, your test die tabs. And you can put those in there. So now we're gonna move on to showers. Here are your numbers on average the average household has two showers per day. On average, we're using 18.6 gallons per shower. The duration is eight minutes and 42 seconds. And the average gallons per minute is 2.14 gallons per minute. So those are, those are the basic numbers. Here's the math as it relates to an individual. If you eliminate one shower per day, you can save 50% or 49% of your daily indoor water goal. So that's, that's an amazing amount of, uh, of savings. And if you reduce it by two minutes, it's another 11% on your indoor goal. Now I mentioned already, we're gonna roll all this, these data points up to show you how all these individual acts add up to a lot of savings. You can install low flow devices. The, the county offers a lot of uh, these shower heads and they come in different models. You can go to the local hardware store and buy these. This unit here is the one that's given away for free and the others are some really good looking low flow options. Another thing you can install are these uh, on and off devices that will allow you when you're sudsing up or, or shaving or whatever in the shower to turn off the water or turn down the water which will allow you to save water 
while you're in the shower. They're pretty easy, they're not very expensive, and you just add them in between your, your pipe and your shower head. So actions you can take to save water. Check for leaks at the faucet when, where you turn the, the, the spigot on to turn on the shower. If it's dripping a lot of water there, you want to you fix that leak. That's a, a great opportunity. You want to install low flow shower heads. A lot of folks, they, 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 they're, they're realizing that there's a lot of water being used, getting cold water to hot water. They're putting buckets or tubs underneath the spigot waiting for the water to get hot. So it's a great technique to save a lot of water. You don't want to use a very big bucket because water is very heavy. Maybe nothing more than two or three gallons. You fill that up and then go water your backyard. Install one of those quick devices I just showed you, one of those turn off devices. And then certainly install a low flow shower head. You can get one of those free. And there's also timers, shower timers that are available. Here's some images of that, the four minute timer. You can install one of these timers and you put that on the, the tile or the glass door and you turn it and, and once this thing empties out it's been four minutes. So let's move on to faucets. On average we're using 33 gallons per household per day with our faucets. We have 57 events per day. That means during the day in the average household, 57 times we're turning on that faucet, on and off, on and off, on and off. For me, this is something that I'm really paying attention to. It's really amazing when you, when you think of 57 as a, as a daily occurrence and being aware that, you know what, this is one of my 57, now maybe I don't need to turn, the, turn it on, or being very concerned or aware of how long I keep that water on. And, and so it becomes an opportunity. 35 minutes is the average use time, 37 seconds, of those 57 events, we're on for 37 seconds. So there's a lot of numbers here, but the bottom line is we use our faucets a lot and that becomes an opportunity to, for reduction. So here's the math. If we used 38.5 gallons per day for, throughout the year, it's 14,000 gallons a year. So what, what I'm asking you to do is reduce five minutes of your 35 minute use time and that will equal 14 and a half percent savings on your annual or daily use. So again moving towards your daily goal of 25 percent that's 14 percent right there. So we're gonna look at that number in a while. Actions you can take. Again repair your leaks. Adjust the valve pressure. Get underneath the cabinet and turn that valve down a little bit. What you do is turn the water on full and then turn the water down, maybe about half or three quarters, right in that area, so that when you throw that faucet on, even at full, you're using less water than you were before. It's easier to turn it off at the gate valve than to do a self-adjustment every time you turn on that faucet. And that works really well. I've done that recently and I've noticed a significant savings. Okay, oh, avoid unnecessary running of water when you're shaving or brushing your teeth or other things. If you're having to soap up your hands, turn off the water, soap it up, turn it back off, and rinse it again. Little things, it doesn't seem like a lot, but again, at 57 events, 37 seconds, uh, again, keep, keep your mind on the goal of reduction. Also, in, uh, inserting these low flow faucet aerators, something like this, this goes on a bathroom, or a kitchen sink. Clothes washers. Here are the numbers. On average, we do one load of laundry per day. Now that's, that's average throughout California. Some people are going to say, well, I don't do that much. But some people actually do more than that. So if you only do three a week, and the average is seven a week, that means somebody might be doing ten a week. So there's a lot, of, a lot of laundry being washed out there. And on average, we're using 36 gallons per load. So those are your baseline numbers. Here's the math. If you can eliminate one load of laundry per week, you're going to save just under 2,000 gallons per year. And you're going to have a 13.5% reduction in your daily use. So what, you, what can you do? What actions can you take? Always do a full load. And somebody asked me, well, why do I have to do a full load? Well, if you have a smart machine or a new machine, they actually weigh the laundry. So it doesn't really necessarily matter if it's full. But if you don't have a smart machine, then you definitely want to fill it up because it's going to use the same amount of water whether you've got it a third full 
or 100% full. So on, on, an, on an older unit, you definitely want to make sure you're running with a full load. You want to reduce the number of loads. You want to look to buying a high efficiency unit. And then the, the county, the Contra Costa Water District rather, is offering rebates on high efficiency units. And you can get up to $150 on these units right now. And you go to their website, be a list of these high efficiency models on the marketplace that qualify for this $150 rebate. Leaks, this is a big opportunity. It represents 18% of your daily use, but they're basically unseen or ignored. And it represents an 81% consumption or opportunity in your daily diversion goal. 31 gallons per day per household are being leaked in the form of small and large leaks. There are basically two kinds of leaks. There's an intermittent leak and a continuous leak. So here's an example. An intermittent leak might be a faucet that's got a, a handle that if you don't get all strong and tighten it all the way down, it's gonna leak. So sometimes you remember and you tighten it so it doesn't remember, it doesn't leak rather. And sometimes you forget and you don't tighten it all the way and so it drip, drips. So that's an intermittent leak. A continuous leak would be something that might be hidden behind the walls on a, on a fitting or on an old pipe that's finally failed and this thing is dripping all the time. Now you look at that patina on there and it has taken a long time for that material to, to, to corrode like that. So this has been happening for years. So every day this house is one of those households that's doing that 31 gallons per day. So you wanna, you wanna look for these leaks and repair them and eliminate them. So what do you do? Again, fix the leaks. Another area is, uh, again, check your faucets. You want, to, you want to check the flappers in your toilets. Look at that image right there. You can see the flapper is all curled up. So every time you flush, you know, you, you dump the water out of your tank, and then when it fills up, it's going to be leaking slowly around that funky old flapper. So they're really easy to replace. They just take a couple minutes, and you're going to save water instantly. Another important thing to do is to take a look at your meter. If you turn every appliance off or every water user in your house off and you go out and that dial, that little red dial on the left is turning, that means you're using water. And there are videos available on the Water District's website or if you just Google how to read a water meter on your internet, you'll see many, many videos available that will show you how to read your meter so that you can determine whether or not you've got a leak. And then lastly, the kind of the small time users are baths, your dishwasher, and then the famous category other. So baths are great, but they are a, a large water use opportunity on average 35 to, to 50 gallons. Enjoy them on occasion, but really your best way to go is with a shower. And then just like your, your laundry, you want to make sure that your dishwasher is full so that you maximize the use of that water when you're doing dishes. And then the other is just miscellaneous uh, uh, events or activities that are more hard to classify uh, on this measurement. So how does it all add up? All those different options that you have in terms of water conservation add up. So toilets, minimize two flushes a day, you're going to save five and a half gallons. Showers, shorten by two minutes, you're going to save 4.3 gallons. Faucets, reduction by five minutes, another five and a half gallons. Your clothes washer, one load less, an average of 36 gallons per week. You, ro you roll all that up, this is what I'm calling the easy stuff, you're at 51.3 gallons, or just over half of your daily goal for your indoor use. And then if you fix all those leaks in the house, you immediately get a big gain and you can have 134.5% on your water savings. So your opportunity there is to look for the leaks and fix them and that makes your daily goal or a reduction goal much easier to achieve. So now we're going to move on to outdoor water conservation. The US EPA focuses in on three major areas to conserve water. That's your landscaping, your irrigation, and stormwater management or rain barrels. And we're going to talk about all of those issues. Back to that Aquacraft study, it recognizes uh, reducing your irrigated areas, 
encouraging the use of low or, or no water use plants, kind of drought tolerant plants, and ways to prevent over irrigation. We're going to go into all these topics in great detail. So this is the no-no list. And this is similar to what we saw earlier in terms of what the state of California is requiring all households to do. We have to reduce or, or eliminate watering between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. So basically install a timer is one option. No outside watering that, that results in running down the gutter. That kind of makes sense. No more washing of vehicles or trailers without a control top hose or a nozzle. No watering of hard surfaces. Use a broom. There's a lot of commercials and, and campaigns I'm seeing out right now that just are really focusing in on using a broom. It's really not that hard to do. And elimination of non-recirculating fountains. So if, if your fountain is just kind of a one way, you've got to turn that off by law. No more than twice per week watering. And if there has been a rain event, you have to wait 48 hours or two days before you water again. So those are your basic no-nos. So kind of a little bit of humor here. Does your landscape have a drinking problem? If you see pooling water like that around a, an emitter or some part of your irrigation system, you've got a major leak or, or something's wrong, don't just ignore it. It's not going to fix itself. You want to check that out and address that. So here, here's the state of California's uh, Save Our Water website's recommendation on ways to save water outside. Uh, appropriate plant selection is, is the first option. The right plants for your soil. Good efficient irrigation. The use of mulch whenever possible. I really focus in on this. And then appropriate maintenance. Uh, a good system that's periodically maintained will save you water and make your life a whole lot easier. So as I mentioned, uh, mulch is one of my favorite ways to save water. Uh, it has a lot of benefits and bonuses. It helps weed, prevent weed production because what happens is when you blanket out a bunch of organic matter, ground wood or finished compost on the soil, that blanket becomes a barrier to photosynthesis. In other words, if there's a seed in the ground, that blanket of mulch makes it more difficult for that seed to grow and germinate. So instead of having hundreds of weeds, you may only have a half a dozen weeds. And they're also easier to basically weed out because your soil is going to be moist under the mulch. So you're able to pull those weeds out easily and actually toss them out and make them part of your, your mulch. It, uh, incorporating mulch on your soil helps to prevent soil compaction. It, can, it regulates and keeps your soil temperatures more even during the, the hottest part of the summer or the season. And it also helps to promote healthy soil and healthy plants. You're creating a microorganism uh, habitat in that, in that organic matter on your soil and all the bugs and all the microorganisms are going to live in there and improve your soil condition. In other words, you're going to get more worms. Okay, so there's a good example of how you can use ground wood as a mulch material. It looks really handsome and it keeps those weeds down. Another option is to take advantage of the Contra Costa Water District's coupons that the local landscapers or the landscape supply companies have coupons so we can go buy mulch material at a discount. It's okay to be raw and here I'm, I'm kind of being funny about learning how to compost. How many people have a compost bin in their, in their backyard right now? It's great, I see a lot of hands going up. It's a really wonderful activity to divert material away from the landfill, but then you get to take that compost and put it into your soil and Compost has tremendous water holding capacity. Here on, the, on the, the, the bottom bullet point there, it says that with just a 5% increase in organic matter, read compost, you're going to quadruple the soil's water holding capacity. So in other words, put some compost in the dirt and it's going to conserve water because it's going to keep the water in place and you don't have to water as often. So it's a really great opportunity. And then here we've got the, the fancy phrase Xeriscape. And Xeriscape is, like I said, a fancy phrase, but it basically means water conserving landscape, low or no water plantation. And, and basically you mimic the native plants that, that grow here in Northern California. 
And uh, there are many different ways of calling it water conserving, water conserving landscapes, drought tolerant landscaping, smartscaping, California friendly, bay friendly. They're all basically techniques on planning throughout your property that allow you to save a lot of water. So here's a few images you can see. It doesn't have to be anything stark like a desert. It's a very handsome landscape right there. You can see they're incorporating a lot of organic matter or mulch and some drought tolerant plants. Here they're going more of the, the, the succulent and cactus mode with rocks and, and cacti in there. Or you can also go with low water using flowers. So it doesn't have to be un, unpleasant or ugly maybe. It can be very, very lovely if you choose the right, right plants. The Contra Costa Water District has the Lawn to Garden Rebate Program. They're offering a, kind of a bounty on your lawn up to $1,000. A, thousand, a, a dollar per square foot. You definitely want to check out their website. They've got all the details in, in terms of how to participate in the program. And they also offer two hours, they'll reimburse you for two hours in the use of, of a professional landscape designer. They'll come out and advise you on how to redesign your front yard. Uh, it's a great opportunity, so go to the website to get more information on that. And then some basic water-wise tips here. We've got a, a, a photo of a manzanita, which definitely is water conservative. So here we go. Again, watering two days per week. And if you've got mature plants, they can handle even as low as one time a week. And when you have plants that are, are very mature, they have hardy root systems, and they're, they're going to be more tolerant. So you, they're, again, going to that, that low and no water uh, plantation is really the way to go here in Northern California. Survey says that the best way to water is by hand. It's the most efficient and it's the, the most conservative in terms of watering. The downside is it takes a little longer, but I look at that as an upside because it gets you to slow down, get outside, and kind of hang out with your plants for a few minutes or maybe longer, and, and it's really a pleasant way to, to spend your time perhaps. So, watering by hand is very in inexpensive. Basically, it's a hose and a nozzle. You get out there and you water. Okay, and the water district is offering free water nozzles. So just get a hold of them and get yourself a free water nozzle if you need it. So, another tip here are these quick release devices that allow you to set up your nozzles and different hoses with this quick release mechanism. It's a one-time setup and they're really, really handy. Uh, using a drip system is also a good way to go. Uh, a drip system is your next best way to go if you're not going to hand water using a simple irrigation system and there's a lot of new technology or, or reinventing of these emitters. So if you go to your local hardware store and talk to the person in the landscape area, they're going to maybe give you some good options on some of the, the new sprinkler heads or, or, or drip system heads that are out there. And if you've got an old system, you might want to go look at some of the new heads because they're going to be more efficient and actually a little bit better at watering than just a few years ago. So you want to check that out. And there's an image of that timer that I was just telling you about. Using a drip system, if you don't have the time to hand water, has some benefits. You're going to prevent disease because rather than watering everything, and some of the plants are, are not so keen on being overwatered, they might, they might mold or get some powdery mildew. With a drip irrigation system, you're dripping right at the root system instead of spraying all over the, 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 the plants themselves. So that helps to minimize potential disease. It's also going to minimize weed growth because in spreading, instead of spraying all over the area, you're just going to be putting water directly on a particular plant and not watering the open soil around the plant, promoting more weed, weed growth and production. Okay. In this image here on the left, you can see this got a little uh, kind of an interesting little gizmo there that you'd mount up on your, your drain system, on your gutter system, up on the, the upper edge of your house. And what that does is it can sense when there's water or when there's a rain event. Now that, that's pretty fancy, but since then, there are now smart timers, modern intelligent devices that are actually talking to satellites that will adjust your timing schedule. So let's say you set it for twice a week, so many minutes. It will know based on satellite images and information about weather patterns whether or not it should 
continue to water today or it says, hey, it's going to be a, a, a moist day or a rain day or a cool day and it will adjust your, your water pattern. So getting these smart irrigators are, are really a, a, a really great option. And you can save money that the EPA estimates that you can save nearly 8,800 gallons of water with these, with these timers. Now, like anything, you have to make sure that they're set properly. So if you don't adjust it or, or set it initially correctly, you could actually end up wasting water. So it's very important to, to read the owner's manual and set these things so that you're not wasting any water. So here we go, we've got these weather-based irrigation controllers. And that's what we mean by smart timers. And uh, the water district is offering uh, uh, a reimbursement on particular models. So once again, you're going to want to go to the website, the Contra Costa Water District's website, and find out what models qualify for this discount. In order for that discount, however, you must receive one of their free water use surveys. So you have to engage with them to qualify for re 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 reimbursement on that uh, emitter. So again, you're going to need to work with the water district to get a survey to qualify uh, for a rebate on your smart timer. And these home use evaluations, it's going to inspect both indoor and outdoor use. They're going to identify opportunities. They might even be able to give you some tips on how to read your meter. So there's a lot that comes out of having these uh, evaluations. So you want to contact the district on how to participate in their survey program. So, for those of you that have pools and hot tubs and spas, you have an opportunity to save water. The biggest thing to do is always, when not using the unit, cover it up. You basically save about 50% or conserve 50% due to evaporation by simply covering your pool or spa. Of course, you want to look for leaks, fix them. You want to shut down any unnecessary fountains or waterfalls. That, that's just going to increase you know, your evaporation. And then my favorite one here, it's kind of it's like the tongue in cheek here. Uh, no fun, no fun allowed, no splashing, no water fights. So you just get in there and you just you stay calm. No, but seriously, have fun in the pool. The most important thing is to cover the pool. And then the last bullet there is to cover your overflow. When you're in the pool and you're filling it up and you're splashing around, make sure that you, you kind of plug the overflow area so that the water stays in the pool. And then when you get out and the water's not bouncing all around, you unplug it so that your overflow system is back in line. So there's been a question about pools versus lawns. Some people, some people say, well, pools are really wasteful. When in fact, the information that's out there, a study done by the Los Angeles Times, shows that after three years, it's proven that a pool is more conservative than a lawn of the relative same footprint. So in other words, if you, your pool area is 20 by 20 and your lawn is 20 by 20, your pool actually uses less water than the same square footage as a lawn. So that's pretty interesting. Um, so put in a pool, go swimming, have some fun, take out your lawn. Uh, uh, car washes are also on board with water conservation. And again, going back to the Water District's website, you can get some coupons to local car wash facilities that will give you a discount. And it's shown that using a car wash is more conservative on water than for you washing it at home. Now these are average numbers that are showing that uh, 80, 45 to 80 gallons if you do it, whereas 30 to 45 gallons when you take it to your local car wash. Okay, so to summarize both indoor and outdoor water conservation, here are your top 10 plus actions that you can take. So reduce the number of flushes, take shorter showers, Reduce your faucet use time, fix all of those leaks, and reduce the number of loads of laundry that you do on, throughout the week. Outside, minimize the amount of water-intensive plants. Again, fix all of your leaks. Reduce the number of days that you water, a maximum of two days per week. Water early in the morning or late in the evening. Your best option is watering by hand. 
Your next best option is using an irrigation drip system and then always avoid overwatering, whether it's by hand or with a timer or with a drip system, you always want to avoid overspray and, and any runoff. So kind of this concept, we're talking about water savings. We can read flyers and we can look at a, uh, an online website. A poster doesn't save money. A poster doesn't save water, but you can. So that's the whole idea is to, to recognize the power that you have as an individual to conserve water. And then another idea here is for those who have the privilege to know, and now you do, you have the duty to act. So now that you have some some tools, some techniques on conserving, it's your duty to act and to use those. So I want to throw in kind of an extra little bonus here. One of the things that's really important is when we eat, to understand that it's just not the food that's on our plate, but the, the energy and resources that it takes to put the food on your plate. So here we have an empty plate, and now we've got a plate full of food, and the question as it relates to water conservation is, how much water does it take to put food on our plate? Again, the Los Angeles Times did an interesting study here. This particular plate right here, uh, we've got some, a steak, salad, and some rice, and a small glass of wine. Almost 1,000 gallons of water is required for this one meal. Okay, it's quite amazing. So they took uh, various types of food and liquid, and broke it down, and you can see that, that middle chart right here, right there, it shows proteins and starches and beverages and fruits and vegetables and how much water they take. On the left, the, the larger spheres represent proteins, heavy water users. On your far right, fruits and vegetable, vegetables, using the least amount of water to produce those things. So I'm not proposing starving, and I'm not telling you how to eat. What I'm actually saying is eat everything on your plate because it takes water to put stuff on your plate. And so you don't want to waste your food because you're wasting water as well as the food. So here is a kind of an example of, of different types of liquids and how much water is required to produce or to deliver that. So you can see here that, uh, for example, on the left, just under two gallons per fluid ounce for beer. And then what's the largest water user here is pineapple juice. And then uh, another high user is your uh, milk. So if you really want to save water, drink beer. Okay? So here's another example. You can go to this website, the Los Angeles Times website, and they have this interesting calculator. You can put stuff in the glass or on the plate to kind of run a calculation. So here we've got a couple of eggs, a couple of pieces of bread, a grapefruit, and, and of course beer. And this tally is not a thousand gallons of water, but under just around 230 gallons of water for this water conservative meal. And again, looks like the best option there is beer. Okay, less than 20 gallons for that glass of beer and uh, almost 100 gallons for the eggs. So, you know, it's a pretty easy choice. A liquid diet is a way to save water. Wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> Anyhow. So now that we've gone through all this information on ways to conserve, I'm going to ask you to take a pledge with me. For those of you at home, I'm going to ask you all to raise your right hand and to repeat after me. You ready? I pledge to be a water conservator and to always do my best at conserving and reusing water in as many ways as I can. So congratulations. I'm known as the Waste Sleuth and so you're all now deputy Waste Sleuths. I have a information here on, the, on this slide showing some local resources. Most of you are aware of this. Uh, anybody that knows about the internet knows that you, there's a lot of resources available. So you've got the Contra Costa Water District, the Aquacraft report that I used for a lot of the data throughout this presentation, the state of California and other, other good sources of information are there on that, on that slide. And then uh, I just want to point out that the city of Martinez uh, sponsors many sustainable educational workshops, home composting, worm composting, and this one here is called Zero Waste and Be a Sustainable Citizen. It, it, it goes into 
in depth on ways that you as an individual can do more than you're already doing, way beyond your basic recycling. And it relates to greenhouse gas reduction as, manda as mandated by the state of California. So look for, go to the city's website and look for the list of upcoming workshops. And I wanna thank you for your time today. Thank you very much for coming out. Thank you. Thank you.